President Putin's initial failures in his war in, in Ukraine wasn't just a failure of strategy, but an overestimation of his military's capability, training, and prowess. My guess says that the U.S. political and military leaders may be making a similar mistake given current threats. David Deptula is a retired Air Force Lieutenant General and is the Dean of the Mitchell Institute for Aerospace Studies. General, welcome to the program. Hey, thanks. It's great to be on, Mimi. You say this, <clears throat> quote, the choices Putin made with respect to his military's force structure left him with the wrong force design and poor readiness for the war he chose to fight. Can you explain that? Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Yes, the fact of the matter is that uh, we were all surprised at Putin's poor uh, military performance. Uh, and part of that reason is because of his force design and uh, lack of training. Uh, obviously, generalship of the leaders uh, that he has in place is also a factor. But all of this points to the fact that, <clears throat> similarly, the choices that we've made in recent years and the ones that are being made today are really inadequate to meet the challenges posed by our competitors. And what I mean by that is that <clears throat> we may not be able to build up the needed military power once an ad adversary or an enemy triggers a tripwire. Um, I think I'll recognize that today's world moves way too fast for that. If you take a look at stealth fighters, stealth bombers, and attack submarines as examples, they can't be built overnight. So unless we make the right choices today, there won't be time to recover when an adversary requires us to fight. And my concern is that President Biden's 2023 defense budget plan, rather than reversing America's 30-year decline in defense capability, actually accelerates that decline. Well, General, let's talk about that because the DOD does say that China is the pacing threat, Russia is the acute threat, there is a pivot to great power competition, uh, combat. All the services are modernizing. So what's missing specifically in your view? Well, capacity. Uh, capacity is huge. You know, American leaders are fond of saying that ours is the best military in the world. But what they fail to realize, or at least acknowledge, is that key elements of our forces have shrunk by over half since our last clear-cut victory in a major regional conflict which was 1991's Operation Desert Storm. Um, so, you know, I think that the folks realize or fail to realize that <clears throat> today, the Air Force is currently the oldest, the smallest, and the least ready in its entire history. And, and so here's what the defense budget does. The current proposed defense budget calls for the Air Force to retire about 1,500 aircraft over the next five years while only buying 500 replacements. That makes the Air Force uh, smaller by another 25%. And it's not just the Air Force. The Navy's set to sh uh, shed 24 ships over the same period. Well, well, General, let's talk about the Air Force since you bring that up. What aircraft does the Air Force need? How many, what will it cost over the president's budget plan? Well, the fact of the matter is the only fifth generation stealth aircraft in production today um, is the F-35. Uh, currently, in the proposed budget, uh, there are only 33 being purchased. Just to maintain the average age of the Air Force, we'd have to buy 72 aircraft a year. So what, we're not even buying what it would maintain, require to maintain the aircraft that we have. So, you know, specific numbers are, in terms of dollars, I'll leave that to the budgeteers. Uh, but the fact of the matter is, it's not a matter that we can't afford these aircraft. The Congress of the United States makes a determination of the amount of funding that's required to meet the needs of our national security strategy. And right now, the uh, president has not proposed what's adequate and the Congress has not provided the funding to do so. So, so, so we let's say, well, let's say, though, a General, that Congress does approve it. How long do you think it would take for the American military to be in a position to take on China and Russia simultaneously and win? Ha! Huh. Uh, it's an interesting question, Mimi, but what it requires um, is immediate investment 
to reverse this decline in our military capacity. Um, we, it's a subjective analysis, uh, but the goal ought to be that we can get healthy by the end of the decade. Um, and we could do that um, if, in fact, that we applied the resources and started buying the equipment. I mean, my gosh, just to put for your audience these, these issues in context, the youngest B-52 bomber is over 60 years old. We're flying fighters that are 40 years old. I mean, this is ridiculous, and it's really negligence, uh, and we need to be able to increase our force structure to be able to fight just one of these major regional conflicts, much less two. And, uh, General, you know, finally, the, the Russian foreign ministry put out a list of Americans who are permanently banned from entering Russia. You're on that list. So my question is, how did you get on Putin's you-know-what list? Well, um, you'd have to ask Mr. Putin or the Russian foreign ministry themselves. But what I would tell you is if there's ever an example since World War II of a nation fighting against all odds for the freedoms that our nation regards as unalienable, it's the people of Ukraine. Um, so we need to act now to support them to the greatest degree possible. And I'm very proud uh, to be considered by the Russian foreign ministry as someone who's been effective uh, in coming to the assistance of the Ukrainian people, or at least advocating for that assistance. All right, General, we appreciate you being on the program. Thank you very much. You bet. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed the video, give it a thumbs up and subscribe to our channel so you don't miss out on any future Government Matters interviews.